Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's October 31st, 2017. And today we're speaking with Robert Taylor, an eminent political scientist and historian of Myanmar for many decades now, about his recent book, The Political Biography of General Ni Win, published by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, 2015, and just now published in Burmese translation, just last weekend. Hello, Bob. Good afternoon. First, congratulations on the recent Burmese translation of your 621-page long biography of Ne Wing. At the book launch, your two translators remarked on the difficulty of translating such a work into Burmese. Most scholarly books in English do not receive the privilege of a Burmese translation. Why do you think your book was translated, and what do you hope it will achieve for a Burmese audience in 2017? Well, I suppose it was translated because the translators and the publisher believed it would be of interest to Myanmar readers. I mean, after all, they're looking for the, the, the benefits of the publication as a publication, as a, as a thing that people buy, purchase. Mm-hmm. I suppose that they felt that uh, it would be interesting to, to know a bit about Myanmar's past. And they went and played a crucial role in that past, so why not have a biography of him? They don't necessarily agree with it, but they, they think other people should read it. Fair enough. In the biography, um, you choose to frame Nguyen's later political life, uh, largely in terms of the Cold War, I would say. So, in your own words, uh, who was Nguyen and what is his importance to Myanmar's 20th century political history? And following that, perhaps if you would like to... Um, indicate what you believe, after all of your research, what was his biggest success and perhaps his biggest failure? Okay. Well, I would slightly question your, your question, to the extent that I think his latter part of his career was framed both by the Cold War and also by his previous legacy as a, as a participant in the Burmese nationalist movement uh, and the ideological issues that, that grew out of that. Um, and then the Cold War thing is how Myanmar as a socialist country which didn't like communism, but had sort of ambivalent feelings about it, uh, were caught in the middle. It was caught in the middle, and Nguyen was part of all of that. But if the greatest success, I suppose, was keeping Myanmar out of the Cold War, uh, keeping China happy, um, keeping the Americans reasonably happy, keeping the Russians sort of contented, um, and that required the country to duck its head in and, and, and withdraw from involvement in, in other countries' affairs. Uh, the failure, of course, obviously, was the economy. But he's not the only socialist leader who failed. Uh, no other socialist economy succeeded either. So, mm. But socialism was what everyone in the Burmese nationalist movement, almost everyone in the Burmese nationalist movement, from the 1930s onwards, thought they should do. Uh, so partially the, the book's couched in uh, the framework that I used in an earlier article about uh, the bankruptcy of Burma uh, was a disaster release. Uh, that's a question that other people can answer, though. Okay, since you've brought up the economy, um, let's go to the fact that Nguyen is, you know, quite a um, divisive figure, I suppose. Maybe with, at least from my perspective, most people being more critical than um, applauding of him. Um, by Burmese people, especially in, in Yangon, there's a huge amount of resentment and personal blame attributed to him for overseeing the downfall of uh, Burma's preeminent economic position in Southeast Asia to the ignominious moniker of a least developed country. So it's fair to say Nguyen is not popular with, with locals and with scholars and analysts. Given your research, how fair do you think this widespread critical sentiment is? Well, he clearly didn't create socialism on his own. And because he was the figurehead, uh, he naturally draws the, the greatest attention. Um, so if you want to condemn the system and condemn socialism, you have to personalize it. You personalize it in the form of Ne Win. And of course, in creating a one-party political system, he arrested a number of people. and um, Myanmar didn't become the liberal democracy that people today think it should be. But people didn't think in the past like they do today. Um, and people are trying to forget the past uh, when they condemn everything that happened without con- understanding why it happened, when it happened, the way in which it did which is what I tried to do in the book. Because I lived here in the 1970s and 1980s. And if you read what the diplomats wrote who were here in the 1970s and 1980s, 
They were not condemning it in the way in which they did and the foreign governments did after 1988. There's a complete flip-flop in the language which is used. Mm. Um, because people before the end of the Cold War, um, before the end of socialism in Myanmar, uh, before Doi Moi in Vietnam and, and Deng Xiaoping in China, they viewed these issues quite differently than we do today. And it's sort of, as one of the problems with her earlier history is nationalist myopia. But now there's sort of economic myopia. People can't actually see the past for what it was and just condemn it out of pride, out of hand. So on the, on the sort of foreign criticism of Nehuin, some of this also rests on his supposed superstition. So such irrational beliefs are still given as a reason for many of the catastrophic decisions that crippled Myanmar, such as the demonetizations of Jap. Your book barely touches on this aspect of his character. Why is that? Because I couldn't find any evidence to it. Almost all the decisions he made, you could explain on some other basis other than superstition. Uh, I found no serious scholar or, dis or academic discussion or diplomatic discussion or in all my interviews with people, um, serious consideration of things being decided on the basis of superstition. Uh, and if you can run a country for 26 years on the basis of superstition, <laughs> it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, he may have been superstitious. I don't know. I don't have any evidence for it other than articles by Bertel Lintner and where he got his sources since he wasn't in Yangon, it's hard to know. Although you do spend a lot of time on uh, Nguyen's political career in, in light of the Cold War, um, since the late 1930s, Nguyen's political and military career was near the center of Myanmar's politics. And you do say in the book that if he governed alone for 26 years, he governed with others for nearly as long. You do give substantial attention to the events before his rise to eventual dictator in 1962. So what can we learn by looking at the young Nguyen? Well, first of all, his ambivalence about politics initially. No real interest in politics as such as one can see. But then over time, how he developed interest in it. Um, strictly as a nationalist, I think, rather than a socialist. But the fact that Aung San and, and the other people that he worked with are all socialists, he became a socialist as well, even though his father was a capitalist by any means. Um, and he certainly was ambivalent, I think, about introducing socialism. It was an experiment he didn't, wasn't sure it was going to happen. Although there's an interview with uh, the wing commander of the RAF, who was here at the time in the mid-1950s, saying, well, there's some aspects of communism he found attractive, as many Buddhists do. And, of course, this is the time that... Uh, Schumacher and others were writing about small is beautiful and all this sort of stuff and socialism and self-sufficiency and self-reliance. These were all in the air as alternatives to capitalism. Uh, and many people after the Second World War were looking for alternatives to capitalism because of the period of state planning, etc., etc., as well as half the world's population at least probably believing that communism was a good thing. You know, of course, no one would think that today or very few people. So if he wasn't interested in politics and he became the leader of the country for so long, was it just an accident that he arrived there? Well, it wouldn't, ultimately it wouldn't be an accident. I mean, he joined the Dobama CEO and he got involved with it thanks to his, his cousin. Um, he got chosen to be one of the 30 comrades. There some people suggest it was an accident that he became one. Well, we, nonetheless, he did. He was a nationalist who, who felt he should do something for the country, and he did. And then he rose, of course, to the army, and once you get... As he once said, you know, once you get on the tiger's tail, or get on the tiger's back, rather, holding the tail, it's hard to get off. I suppose we all end up, you know, if you look back on people's careers, I didn't intend to be an academic. Um, it happened. Um, I didn't intend to be sitting in Yangon today, you know, but here I am. Um, people's careers don't actually pan out as, as perhaps they intended they thought they would, or their mother wanted them to. So you mentioned this getting on the tiger's back. Although Nguyen instigated a social revolution, sorry, a socialist revolution, uh, you say in your book that he was probably not as adaptable to change as he thought he was, or perhaps he should have been, particularly towards the end of his political career. So a revolutionary who was not adaptable to change, what are you referring to here? Well, the fact that, I mean, he wasn't... Uh... 
studying what was going on in other economies at the time, that sort of thing. Um, all of us, as we get old, get crotchety and opinionated and ignorant, according to the young, um, and perhaps he did as well. Um, but he shouldn't, have, you know, he didn't look around to see what was going on in other economies. I mean, Doi Moy, though, in Vietnam was introduced only in 1985, 1985 or six, only two years before the Burmese economy collapsed. And actually, they'd begun creating, attempting to create reforms in 87. Um, and but under, unseen and unbeknownst, there was some de-socialization de going on in the economy through the 1980s. But it was done in such a quiet way, and without the party being actually ideologically involved, BSPP was actually a failure as a party. In many ways, the failure of socialism was a failure of the party, because the Communist Party carries on in Vietnam with the capitalist economy. If the party had been more effectively here, uh, had been more strong than, than it was, this not relying on army cadres, uh, perhaps it could have helped, uh, carried out a reform as the Vietnamese or the communists did in China. But it didn't, because the BSPP wasn't a reliable institution. Hmm. All right, now we're touching on um, this crucial period in Myanmar's history around 1988. So this was uh, when Ne Win uh, somewhat um, gracefully bowed out, although people say he maintained his influence for a long time. How did Ne Win come to retire, and what was his role in the 1988 uh, transformations? Well, he tried to engineer, after he resigned from the party, it's rather fed up if you believe the, the account that Dr. Ma Ma gives. Uh, the thing was a failure, and, and he'd introduced it, so he had to walk away from it. Um, but actually not realizing how much difficult it was to recreate a multi-party system in a capitalist economy, then uh, get rid of one, which he'd done quite successfully in 62. But then he didn't want to see the country fall into chaos. Um, he still felt responsible because he'd created the, the mess that the country was in. So he engineered uh, some of the steps, but not all the steps, that took place between his step resigning in July 88 and the eventual resignation and, and uh, hospitalization of General Solomon. After that, I think he had very little to do with anything. But those crucial steps in between, other than the choice of uh, General St. Lewin as his successor, um, I think he had a hand in, the, that being the choice of Dr. Mao Mao as his second successor, and then his nod at the, the coup or the army takeover in September 88. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, removal of General Solomon, which had to be done very carefully in terms of security of the, of the chain of command in the army. And of course, Nguyen was always concerned about the purity of the army and, and its cogency and its uh, ability not to collapse, split up. Which yeah. Goes back to 1948 and 47. And uh, the concept of unity, which is a, a huge one that political scientists and other scholars play with mm -hmm. um, when they're talking about Myanmar, but it's incredibly important to, to Myanmar people. Uh, on, on that idea of, of unity, perhaps this might be a good time to take a step away from this particular book and look at your career, just briefly, um, outside of it. So you're a political scientist who's written quite a bit of history, mm -hmm. is the way that I read it, and you've got a certain conception of what the state is. And perhaps it's these disagreements on what the state is or what it should be that lead to some of the more vigorous debates you've had over time. Mm -hmm. So you wrote a book called The State in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. When you talk about states, what are you talking about? Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes. The Leviathan. Um, what that thing that J.S. Furnival talked about in his book, The Fashioning of the Leviathan, uh, in 1939. The state is the institution which creates order in societies. Um, it exists amongst other states which recognize each other uh, and establishes international order. Um, rights grow out of the existence of states because rights grow out of law, and law is the instrument of the state. So these things all go together in a package. Uh, and many people confuse, as many people in Myanmar used to do and still do sometimes, confuse state, government, nation as being the same thing. They're not. They're analytically separate entities. And if people don't understand the analytical differences between state, nation, society, etc., then they get confused. And that's where these, many of the attacks on what I've written 
grow out of the fact that people don't read what I wrote rather than they impose their own definitions of these words, which have their technical meanings in political science and political analysis. Okay, and now we've brought up um, criticisms uh, of, of your work. This book has led to some criticisms, um, even of uh, and other work, people have called you such things as an apologist mm. for the previous or ongoing Tamador regime. What do you say to such frank appraisal? Um, they can call me what they like. Uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never harm me. This comes with the territory. I mean, what I tried to write, what I think I've tried to do in my career, is explain things, why they happen. First, to describe what happened, unemotionally, because I'm not a Myanmar. I can't get emotional about Myanmar politics in the way in which a Myanmar person can do. So I try to explain it cogently, unemotionally, with a degree of detachment, a great deal of detachment, as I'm not a Myanmar. And then to the extent of my ability to explain why it happened in terms of the logic of what happened before. Um, because current politics are created by the past. And people's perceptions of the past are very important in terms of their reactions to new opportunities and new threats. And that's the way I try to see politics in my role as, as a political analyst. And I don't try to get emotional and upset and rant and rave because it doesn't do my blood pressure any good anyway. All right, so let's think about uh, let's think about the Nairwin book, and then think about Myanmar you know, politics more generally. So maybe uh, some comparative comments, if you could indulge me, might be appropriate. So how does Nairwin stack up against Unu and Aung San, or even Tan Shui? Are there common threads that you can tease out by exploring how these post-independence male Burman leaders sit side by side? Not really. I mean, I never actually thought about those questions very much. They each had their different um, positions. I think Nguyen's attachment to socialism was very much because of Aung San's attachment to socialism. I don't think he actually thought through. He wasn't an ideologue in the sense that the communists and the youth were who were in the Doma Siyon in the early days um, and the Socialist Party in the 1950s were. He was more of an apparatchik type like Suharto in Indonesia, you know, a general before ideology. New and he were completely different characters. I mean, at least early in Nguyen's career, he had no interest in religion and used to sneer and laugh at it, uh, not only Buddhism, but other religions. Later on, he got serious about Buddhism. Um, perhaps since some people in Myanmar told me he was a better Buddhist than Unu because he didn't preach about it, talk about it all the time. That's an opinion, not mine. Um, I have no opinion on the matter. Than Sui clearly repudiated much of what Nguyen had tried to do in terms of economic policy, but anyone who's going to follow him was going to do that. I suppose Nguyen, if he saw all the money was spent building Napidol, would be appalled. Um, that sort of extravagance in a country with strapped as economically as Myanmar was, he would have seen as perhaps not necessary. On the other hand, he might have seen it as necessary in order to create a, a new situation in the country. I don't know. But he was dead by then, so we'll never know. Aung San still reigns supreme as the independence hero when you go into people's homes. He's the one who has the photo, mm -hmm. and there might be an Aung San Suu Kyi photo alongside. So it seems like the, the populace has somewhat sort of spoken about who was the most important uh, figure, leadership figure in the 20th century. But was Aung San the most important? Was Ni Win equally or perhaps more important in shaping the 20th century political history of Myanmar? Well, Aung San's legacy shaped, I think, much of what Nguyen tried to do, what Nguyen thought Aung San would have done um, had he survived. Uh, and there may be some truth to that. Uh, I don't know. Of course, the, the Aung San story was in many ways boosted by Nguyen using Aung San as part of the justification for this coup and the ideological creation and putting his fix on banknotes and uh, putting his, you know, his, when I lived in Myanmar in the 70s, 80s, there was always a picture of Aung San in a classroom as well as a picture of Nguyen Win in the classroom. Uh, one general following another, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it was Aung San's military career as well as his socialist career that was very much boosted in the public image during this time. And Nguyen Win said in, the, in one of his war veterans association speeches, I'm not the founder of the army, that's Aung San. 
not only the, the stepfather. So he always talked about Aung San as being his leader. He always referred to Aung San Suu Kyi as my, my leader's daughter. Always. Yeah. At least in, in Singapore and abroad. I don't know what he said in this country. But. Okay, before we close up, um, you've had a long storied history working in education as well as researching in, in Myanmar. Um, now we're sitting downtown in 2017. The place has changed a lot. What, what, what do you make of Myanmar in 2017? It's just becoming another Asian mall with a lot of poor people outside who can't afford to, to buy anything inside and walk around and stare at the Gucci stuff. And I'm afraid Myanmar is going to become just like any other country in Southeast Asia where it used to have sort of distinctive characteristics and it remained in some ways distinctive. But as I walk around downtown Yangon these days, my old tea shop that I used to go to for years, which used to be originally located where this building is now, and moved across the street when this building was built, doesn't even serve Mohengai anymore. And since I last visited it 10 months ago, it's been glassed across the front. The stools have been removed. Booths have been put in. It's been air conditioned. And it's horrible. It's just like another 35 cafes in the downtown of the city today. So there's no beetle juice on the floor. Uh, there's no black market stuff along the walls. Uh, and there's no Mohenga or Semenmakin. Well, what can you go to eat? Can't get Mohenga or Semenmakin. Well, that's one uh, thing that isolation does, right? It breeds um, idiosyncrasies. Mm -hmm. Like me. How about uh, if I can draw you out a bit more on the political situation today? Do you see any continuations from the past? How do you uh, make sense of it? Well, obviously the, the continuing effort to end uh, the so-called civil war is an obvious point that continues. Um, and uh, being not a whole lot successful, more successful than in the past. But, uh, it, there's sort of built-in rigidities which are difficult to overcome. Now we're coming up to the 30-minute mark. Um, I wonder if I could trouble you for a recommendation. Would you like to recommend anything to our listeners? Well, if I would recommend anything to people, I would recommend they go back and live in a village in Myanmar that doesn't yet have electricity, that doesn't yet have... Um, all Mod Khans, um, and live there for a week. Um, and you'll find a sort of peace um, that uh, modernization will destroy. Bob, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Myanmar Musings. I really appreciate you giving us the time and all the best with the sales for this Burmese translation of the political biography of Nguyen. Well, I get no royalty, so I don't really care one way or the other. I just hope people read it and enjoy it. Excellent. See you next time. <laughs>